I have a confession to make. I know it might sound crazy, but just hear me out. I think that water levels are actually really underrated. I know that this is an uncommon opinion and it's almost like an integral part of gamer culture to dislike water levels, but I just enjoy them. I get that there are legitimate complaints about them that I can agree with at times. Like annoying movement, slow pacing, and anxiety inducing mechanics like oxygen timers and such. But I just can't help but to feel like they kind of get a bad rap and that the positive sides of water levels heavily outweigh the negative ones in most cases. And this is what the video is about. I'm going to take a deep dive into the subject and do my best to show you why I think they're actually really good and maybe show you some new points of view you might have not thought about before if you're one of the people who really hates them. Personally, I can't help but to get at least a little bit hype when a water level pops up in a game that I'm playing. Like, imagine this for a second. You're playing Super Mario 64 or something like Donkey Kong Country as a kid, sitting in front of a tiny CRT TV in your room. It's already dark outside, you've made some progress in the game, and as you enter the next level, the TV fills your room with a gentle blue hue, and the game hits you with something like this. These kinds of moments made me fall in love with water levels when I was younger, and it's the reason why I still look forward to playing them. There is something special about the atmosphere that water levels, when done correctly, can create, and that shift in vibe created by the switch up when moving from a normal level to a water level in mechanics, visuals and sounds is one of the main reasons why I feel this way about them. Talking about atmosphere in general, it's like the hidden invisible component in video games that you can't really point to, but it definitely is there and it's extremely important in terms of the overall gaming experience. It's like a layer between you and the game that is present in all parts of the game giving flavor and context to whatever is happening within it. And every aspect of gameplay in turn contributes to this layer as well. Of course the visuals, sounds and story affect it, but even the smaller, less obvious aspects like the controls, inventory mechanics and save points can transform how a game's atmosphere feels. Just as an example to show what I mean, Minimal and intuitive control schemes in games can kind of make the controller disappear and help you insert yourself in the point of view of the character to better immerse yourself in their environment. While complex control schemes can in turn amplify the stress in situations where you have to make quick decisions. I'm not saying one is better than the other, there's a time and place for everything, but it shows how small design choices like this can significantly change how a game feels like. And I believe that limiting your focus to a single theme, like the ocean or water, can be such an effective tool for building atmosphere in a level. In terms of water and or ocean based levels, the setting kind of inherently invites you to make the environment really pretty. In the ocean everything is covered in the serene blueness, when you're higher up you can see the sun rays breaking through the surface of the water, and the deeper you go the darker and more mysterious it gets. It's also, simultaneously, inherently scary. You can't breathe underwater, you move slower, and you're floating in this vast, unfamiliar space that might have dangerous monsters that we might not even know about existing there with you. It's crazy to imagine that we've only explored 5% of all of the waters on Earth, and this level of mystery combined with the beauty and the danger results in this very inspiring setting with massive amounts of potential. And when a game utilizes it well and hits all of the right notes, it can make for a very impactful experience. Since the video is about water levels, to preface my takes, I feel like it's important to share what I consider to be a water level. My definition for a water level is pretty loose, so if you disagree with me, it's totally fine. I pretty much consider every water themed portion of a game that involves being in water a water level. Levels where you are only in proximity to water, I don't consider water levels, but levels where you walk in water but you don't swim in it do fit the criteria for me. I will also talk about games that entirely take place in water in this video, since they are, in my opinion, games that just consist of mostly or entirely of different water levels and areas. 
Now, the point of this video is not to convince you to like every single water level. I definitely don't. Not all water levels reach the same level of atmosphere and some of them are just not good. Some water portions in games are just so awful to play that I can't even really manage to enjoy the aesthetic side of them. And some games don't even make the attempt to utilize the setting in any meaningful way, which feels like such a waste when you look at what could be achieved with it. And because of these factors, I can't understand why a lot of us dread water levels in games. It's not fun when your normal gameplay is interrupted by a slower and more frustrating version of the game, and when it's not even pretty, what is even the point? The key parts that in my opinion make a water level good are not limited to just games, and if we take a step backwards and look into the past, we might find different perspectives and a deeper understanding on how this setting has been and could be utilized. Water is literally everything. I mean, our bodies are 70% water, we need to drink water all the time in order to live, and we used to live in the ocean before our goofy ass ancestors got bored and decided to fuck around and grow some legs. And now we're out here complaining about water levels in video games, completely disregarding where we came from. In addition to being necessary for life, historically water, and especially the sea, has been portrayed as something dangerous in many different, even supernatural ways in art and stories. And the sea really was especially dangerous in the past. Before the invention of things like wireless telegraphy, ships would get lost, crash and sink without any possibility of calling for help in time. Voyages would also just take a very long time back then, which would increase the possibility of issues regarding supply management and nutrition. In addition to this, people inspired by the decomposing carcasses of large sea animals washed up on beaches would tell stories about sea monsters capable of sinking ships and luring seafarers to their doom. Like the Kraken in Norway, usually depicted as a massive octopus with the power to pull ships underwater, or the Japanese a sea spirit who appears on calm waters, bringing a storm and destroying surrounding ships in the process. It's not only the sea either, lakes and other bodies of water have been said to inhabit monsters as well, like for example the Nordic Nekki or Nekken, a water spirit who lures people into the lake with the use of song and then drowns them. The danger of water is usually apparent in most water levels. You move slower, everything is harder, and you're basically out of your usual environment. A fish out of water, or more like a person in water. <laughs> This can be seen especially well in the 2014 game Subnautica, for example. Instead of it having one water level, almost the entire game is spent underwater. In the game, you crash land on an almost entirely water-based planet and have to survive against all odds collecting resources amongst hostile alien sea monsters. The game is not officially marketed as a horror game, but just the atmosphere created by the experience of having to survive within the vast and mysterious sea of this planet with dangerous monsters lurking everywhere, in addition to the very effective anxiety-inducing sound design of the game, makes Hypnotica a pretty damn stressful experience. When it comes to survival games in general, Subnautica does a fantastic job of utilizing the element of water in making you feel like you're really in danger, and by doing so, motivating you to take steps to survive and eventually thrive. The premise is gripping, and we're underwater, so the setting is very pretty at times. And as you progress in the game, the feeling of really taking control of the environment, which initially felt so hostile and scary, is undeniably satisfying. The experience is also not hindered by the game's mechanics. Movement in water feels natural and isn't awkward at any point regardless of if you're piloting a vehicle or not. The oxygen mechanics also make sense in a game like this. A lot of the game is built around managing your resources, and oxygen is one of the key resources you manage when you're underwater, which is why it doesn't really feel out of place here. On the more spiritual side of things, water as a purifier or fertilizer has been a significant aspect in many cultures around the world. In games this is not something that is super often explored, but when it is, it can be very interesting. Abzu is another water game where most of the game is again spent underwater. This game pretty much does everything right when it comes to water level gameplay and atmosphere. The movement is kind of slow, but feels very natural and it's actually just kind of fun to simply move around in this game. You have a lot of control, you can do flips and if you time everything perfectly, 
you get the super satisfying speed boost effect. The visuals are just breathtaking, and when mixed with the music in this game, it makes for a very immersive experience. The reason I'm bringing up Absu here is because of the way it uses the spiritual aspects of water in its storytelling. There is no dialogue, so the game leaves a lot up to the interpretation of the player, but we can find some clues to the title of the game. Abzu is also a name of a deity in ancient Mesopotamian religion, a primal being made of fresh water. The word Abzu also refers to, in Sumerian mythology, a primeval sea below the underworld and to fresh water from underground aquifers with religious fertilizing qualities. This makes a lot of sense when it comes to the events in the game, and the creative director of Abzu, Matt Nava, actually has talked about the connection in interviews as well. I'm about to tell you what happens in the game, so if you don't want to get spoiled, please skip to the time on the screen. So, you play as a diver exploring the ocean along with your shark friend, and as you explore, two things become apparent. This environment is being destroyed by technology, and there are these strange magical wells hidden in the depths that contain water with the power to restore life to your surroundings. Some events occur, and you end up losing your friend to the machines, and soon after that you come to the realization that you are a machine yourself. You're directly related to the things destroying your environment, but you decide to keep pushing forwards, and as the final puzzle pieces start falling in place, the game ends in this touching and cathartic climax, where you, together with the ghost of the shark, gain the ability to destroy the machines, purify the ocean from technology, and finally restore life to your surroundings. The game is only 2 hours long, and I definitely recommend it to you if you're into what you're seeing. It does a great job of taking the water slash ocean concept to a place that I've not really seen before in games, and the historical and religious inspirations that the story is based on are also super interesting. In addition to the cultural and historical sides of it, I think water and the ocean is just aesthetically cool. And when a game leans heavily into that aspect of water, it can't just hit super hard even if the gameplay isn't necessarily anything that special. Coral Capers in Donkey Kong Country is the example for me when it comes to the water level aesthetic. The level is not complex and the floaty movement within the water is par for the course in terms of 2D platformers, but the gameplay aspects of the level are not the focal point here. Especially in retrospect, the old pixelated visuals combined with the ethereal and introspective soundtrack of the level combine to create a very enjoyable kind of vapor-wavy experience that is entirely unique to water levels. The pixelated seascape stretching into endless dark blue nothingness in the background creates this feeling of mystery and tranquility to the level, while the delay and reverb drenched synths and piano passages of the soundtrack reassure you that you shouldn't be worried, that everything is going to be fine. This water level was one of the main levels that inspired me to make this video in the first place. Personally, in my own gaming choices, I often value the aesthetic and atmosphere over the other elements in games, and levels like Coral Capers is the reason why. Gameplay-wise, the level is basic, but the impactfulness of the atmosphere created by the visuals and sounds is undeniable. When replaying the game in preparation for this video, I almost didn't even want to finish the level. I instead just wanted to stay there for a while, just existing for a minute before moving along. Another game series that at times captures this kind of similar, ethereal quality is strangely Mario, especially the earlier 3D Mario games. The newer water levels in the series are great as well, and I really enjoyed both of them in Odyssey, but Jolly Roger Bay from Mario 64 is to me one of the great classic water levels that utilizes a similar dichotomy of uncertainty and calmness as Coral Capers did to craft its atmosphere, and again it works so effectively. The swimming mechanics are without a doubt a bit janky. It's one of the first games that did 3D movement right and attempted to immediately take it underwater as well, so it's to be expected. And that combined with the oxygen mechanics and this demonic eel thing lurking around, there's inherent tension everywhere in this level. The music on the other hand might literally be the most relaxing and at the same time strangely motivating track of any game ever. Replaying these levels made me feel super nostalgic for this type of older water level 
and made me kind of wish that more modern games leaned into this kind of stylistic direction more often as well. What these two examples have in common, and what is one of my favorite things about water levels in general, is how ridiculously good the music usually is. Everything is slower in water, and the music usually reflects this as well. The slowness and the reverb and delay that is prevalent in these tracks signify the vastness and the spaciousness of the ocean. And when the higher frequencies are chopped off a bit, you'll literally feel like you're underwater. Now, the specific effects are of course not always the same in all water level tracks, but there is clearly something special about the setting that inspires the artists working on these soundtracks to make an absolute banger every time it's a water level. If you wanted to, you can actually kind of simulate the water level music aesthetic if you take just about any nice track with minimal drums or no drums at all, pitch it down a couple of semitones, add a bit of reverb and delay and boom, you are now underwater. Of course, this is a super simplified and cheap way to make the effect but I just wanted to show you how you can kind of emulate the feeling that some of these tracks create. Vaporwave, the thing I mentioned earlier when describing the feeling of choral capers, is a music genre and a visual style that was born in the early 2010s. Musically, the genre samples a lot of older music, chops it up, slows it down and drowns it in reverb, which kind of fits the musical aesthetic, but thematically Vaporwave focuses on things like 90s consumerism, and nostalgia, which doesn't really fit that well. There is however something a bit more unknown, related to Vaporwave, that describes the thematic and visual sides of those older water levels a lot better in my opinion, and that is what is known as C-Punk. C-Punk is a subculture that began on Tumblr around 2011, which encompasses fashion, music and art, but what I'm interested in regards to water levels in gaming is the digital art side of the subculture. C-Punk imagery typically features 90s net art and video game inspired aquatic themed environments and objects. And here's some examples of what that looks like. Now C-Punk came and went pretty quickly a long time ago already, but a lot of this stuff is to me so reminiscent of my favorite water levels, especially from the more older games, and it also scratches that kind of itch for the more surreal and ethereal type of water level that more modern games rarely ever do. Both Vaporwave and Seapunk lean heavily into nostalgia, which makes me wonder how much of my fondness for this aesthetic is tied to the past, those good experiences as a kid playing through these games and these water levels. Now, you might think that I'm just looking at them to roast in the classes, but I don't think that is true, because there are always some newer water levels that aesthetically feel kind of similar and evoke the same emotions as those older levels do as well. Here's one for example, and it's a pretty weird and interesting one. The Complex Found Footage is a free short horror game in which you explore liminal spaces, dreamlike transitional spaces between locations and states of being through the point of view of a VHS camera. Now even though you don't do much in this game, besides from walking around and looking for the right place to go, the game does a great job of being genuinely terrifying, just on the basis of the tension created by the narrow field of view and the sound design that makes it feel like there could be a monster behind every corner. Around halfway through the game, you make it through to this surreal and very pretty pool area. Instead of cranking up the tension as water levels, especially in horror games, usually do, the water portion of this game completely breaks it and gives you kind of like an opportunity to breathe for a moment. Playing through this area literally feels like walking through those seapunk images we looked at earlier, with the weird pool slash water environment and the seemingly random objects scattered around the level. The music on here sounds kind of like Ave Maria, but extremely slowed down with tons of reverb. It's creepy as hell and at the same time very cool and fits the typical water level music framework we talked about earlier. When I think of a water level in a horror game, the first thing that comes to mind for me is something like this. 
So this really subverted my expectations on what a horror game water level can be and is such a cool take on the concept in my opinion. While the style of the level is for me one of the most important things in this, it alone is not enough to carry the experience. One other aspect that can make or break a water level is its context within the game and its contrast in terms of aesthetic and gameplay in comparison to the normal levels. And I believe that in this contrast lies the reason why so many of the water levels that we hate feel so annoying and to be honest, it makes a lot of sense when you think about it. If 95% of the game is spent on land, it would be understandable that the people responsible for designing the feel of the game in terms of movement would spend most of their efforts on that part of the game. And when such a small amount of time is spent in water, it totally makes sense that not as much effort and time is placed on perfecting how the game feels when you're there, which can result in things like awkward movement and jankiness. This issue is of course only present in games that have separate water portions, and isn't really a problem in entire water games, like some of the ones that we talked about earlier. And I've noticed that usually the janky water movement only becomes a problem in mechanically dense 3D games. In the 2D plane, the usual Flappy Bird style movement where you click the jump button to float upwards and let go to move back down works just fine for the most of the time, in my opinion. It forces you to think about movement differently for a moment and it's super intuitive and easy to pick up. In many 3D games though, the water levels get very janky very fast when things like moving backwards and making sharp turns are not so easy to do anymore. In addition to this, when the camera attempts to follow your janky ass movements, it can result in some genuinely frustrating gameplay. Not even some of the classics escape this, and in fact Mario 64 is a pretty bad offender of this. Just moving around feels awkward and half of the time it feels like the camera is trying to make sure that you stay as disorientated as possible when you attempt to do literally anything underwater. Another newer example of this is Sekiro. Sekiro has in my opinion the best sword fighting mechanics in any game ever. You carefully observe the enemy's movements and time your deflects according to the swings of your opponent's swords while paying close attention to the subtle and fast approaching pieces of information the game is showing you in order to make the right decisions quickly. But when the game attempts to take those mechanics underwater and throws mini-bosses at you, the already established rules of combat get thrown out of the window and everything becomes unbelievably clumsy and just bad. Deflecting feels pointless underwater, the camera is trying to kill you and this this doesn't really mean anything anymore. You thankfully don't do a lot of fighting underwater in this game, but when you actually have to do it, the experience just feels like you're blindly hitting buttons, hoping that you kill the enemy somehow while dodging its attacks. Another kind of janky water level that I actually think is kind of good is the fight with the water monster in Shadow of the Colossus. You don't do much movement underwater in this game, and in the case of this fight, you just swim to the exact right point in the water to be able to catch on to the monster, and then you just hold on to it when it goes underwater. The monster and the aesthetic of the level is very cool, and the tension in the fight caused by the challenge of conserving your stamina underwater is great and imaginative, but the reason it's so janky is because trying to gauge the position of the monster and find the right spot while moving ridiculously slowly is extremely frustrating. The contrast between the normal movement and the movement in water is not super noticeable on here though, because uh, the entire game kind of feels like you're underwater in the first place. Designing a system like an Abzu for something that only takes a tiny portion of the game is understandably unfeasible, but in my experience, movement doesn't have to be needlessly complex in order to be good in a 3D space. And some of the best games in this regard actually do it almost the exact same way as the 2D games did in the past. If we go back to Subnautica for a second, the movement when you don't have a vehicle is super simple and intuitive. You hold space to go up, and you hold C to go down. Outside of that, you can go in any direction you like. It works really well and it really doesn't have to be more complicated than this. 
Another game that does this is actually Minecraft. When you're in water, you press shift to go down, and you press space to go up. When the mechanics consist of such few elements, the transition from non-water level to water level is easier, which allows you to instead focus on the key gameplay elements, and as a whole there are simply less opportunities for awkwardness. Overall, I can't deny that the underwater mechanics when a developer is doing too much can be frustrating at times, but they don't have to be, and in many cases they aren't. When the movement mechanics are simple, it only leaves characteristics like the overall slower pacing, which is more of a matter of taste, and underwater specific mechanics like oxygen timers to significantly differentiate them mechanically from the more normal levels. In the case of oxygen timers, they can be, in my opinion, a great tool to create tension, but they definitely aren't needed in every single water level. If the gameplay is already extremely difficult compared to the normal levels, adding an oxygen timer can be a bit unnecessary. In most cases, I think that the developer should not feel pressured to attempt to create a system that in the end, in many cases, ends up only affecting the experience negatively. Making the movement mechanics somewhat similar to how they are in the rest of the game would make the transition from normal level to water level easier for the player. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I would imagine that the workload in terms of development could be lighter as well. Taking the time to focus on such a small specific portion of games was a lot of fun for me, and will definitely change how I view water levels going forward. And in this case, spending so much time thinking about these levels cemented for me that water levels are not as bad as people make them out to be. They are a mixed bag when it comes down to it, and whether you like them or not, a lot of it is based on what you as a player value in games. If the smoothness of the mechanics is the most important thing to you, I could easily imagine that water levels are not your favorite. And if you're really into the water level vibe, you do probably like them. In my case, I value the aesthetics and the atmosphere of the other elements, so I can overlook some of the bullshit, but even for me, there's a point where the negatives outweigh the positives. How do you guys feel about water levels? And do you have the same type of appreciation as I do for the vibes in those older water levels? Please let me know in the comments. Um, this is the end of the video. Uh, thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, please leave a like. And if you want to see more videos like this, please subscribe. I've been super busy lately, so this one took a bit longer to make than I expected. And I'm sorry about that. But yeah, thank you again for watching.